Okay, good evening, everyone. I'm sorry to cut the conversation off. It's already 6.08 and we need to get the, the, the show uh, started. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to open in a word of prayer. And then I have a passage of scripture that I want to read to us by way of encouragement. And then we will get into the PowerPoint and uh, we'll have breakout rooms. So let's go ahead and open it in a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for all you've done. We thank you for your grace and for your love. And we want to exalt your name. We want to lift it up high. We want to exalt your word and reverence it tonight as we study it. Father, may you uh, uh, be lifted up in our minds. May we meditate upon these great truths, Father God. Father, we ask that you would um, strengthen and guide us. I pray that you would um, lead us in all truth and that we would have understanding eyes to see and ears to hear. And especially tonight, Father, that we would understand and recognize the great um, destruction of, of sin and, and how great sin is in the human race and that you revealed this to us. You allowed sin to increase and to, and to grow, uh, to real, reveal to us what's in all of our hearts. And it's only through your grace and your spirit that we can overcome this. It's nothing within ourselves. And so we just ask that these truths would be revealed to us this time. It's in your son's precious name we pray all these things. Amen. Okay, so welcome to Biblical Theology, the blossoming of God's revelation from Adam to Christ. And so let me just, I'm going to pause the, the slideshow and I want to share with you um, just a brief passage of, of scripture. So <clears throat> we will be using Step Bible more and more. This is the the this is one of the tools that we need to be using in our in our class and i apologize for not being consistent with that so we have step bible here and and throughout the rest of this semester we'll be using it as our bible and uh um, we really need to be uh using it as a tool it's very powerful and so i want to set the example for all of us tonight so uh just a word of encouragement to you and i'm actually going to be quoting from Psalm 19, if you have your Bibles, you can open there. And this is one of the fundamental passages of scripture that puts alongside God's natural revelation, God's general revelation, and God's special revelation. And, and we need to see how the two are related and how the two are absolutely fundamental to our, our present and also to the future. So I'm just going to read it and maybe I'll make one or two comments and that's it. The word of the Lord says, Psalm 19, verses 1 to verse 14. The heavens declare the glory of God. The sky above proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours out speech. And night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words, where, uh, whose voice is not heard. Their voice goes out to all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In them he has set a tent for the sun, which comes out like a bridegroom leaving his chamber. Like a strong man runs its course with joy. Its rising is from the heaven, the end of the heavens and its circuit to the end of them. And there is nothing hidden from its heat. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold, sweeter also than the honey and drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is your servant warned. In keeping them, there is great reward. Who can discern his errors? Declare me innocent from hidden faults. Keep back your servant from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless and innocent of great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. And so this is just an absolute profound passage of scripture that really highlights for us that natural revelation is proclaiming in, in all of creation is proclaiming um, God, his glory, his word. And 
And then that transitions to special revelation, the law of the Lord. The law of the Lord is absolutely fundamental for our life, for our spiritual maturity, for, for living a wise life. And so there is nothing else be, besides these that we need for life and holiness. And the conclusion is really a warning. Um, the warning is that who can discern his errors? And I think what I want us to see here is that we're going to see tonight that God, man's heart is so deep, that the heart is so corrupt. And it's almost like... <laughs> We have so much sin that we, we, we don't always see it. And so I really want to encourage us that we as leaders need to be living humble lives and, and not as much pointing fingers, but looking into our own heart to see where our, where our error and where our sin is. And, and for us, may our prayer be this, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. Notice he doesn't say made my actions. Okay, and that's not to say actions are not important. It is to say that meditation of the heart and words of my mouth are more fundamental. They're more fundamental. If your meditation of the heart is correct, if your words of your mouth are acceptable in the sight of God, everything else follows. And so this is more fundamental. And so we're going to tonight be looking at the heart of man. And so um, may this be our prayer. May this be our prayer to, to, to God, to our Father, to His Son tonight. Father, may our, the words of, of our mouths, the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in, in your sight. O oh Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Okay, so that's all I had. I just hope that you're challenged by that and maybe you can contemplate that this week. And um, at this time, let's, let's go back to the PowerPoint. And um, let me just share again. Great. So uh, just moving along here, uh, we always want to give credit to those that are partnering with us. Cebu Graduate School of Theology. Many of you are enrolled there. Also EBSC, Eastern Visayas School of Theology, and Converge as well. And so these partners are making this happen. And so we always want to thank the Lord for his faithfulness and bringing us together. And uh, tonight we're on to session number seven. So we are, we are close. And I think next week we'll be almost halfway. So we are getting close. It, it seems crazy because we're only like, we will only will have been nine chapters through and the semester is almost half done. Okay. But I hope that, I hope that you really see that Genesis, the Pentateuch, this is foundation for the rest of scripture. So even though we're still at the foundation, if our foundation is deep, if it's solid, then the rest, the building is going to go up so easily. <laughs> There's going to be, it's going to be a beautiful structure. So we're finishing setting the foundation. And so session number seven tonight is the mode and content of special revelation during the Noachian period. And so just a brief overview of the session tonight. What we're going to do first is we're going to have breakout session, a breakout room. So you'll be breaking, break, uh, you will break out into groups and you will discuss and you won't be able to discuss all of the content of your reading. Okay. What I want you to do is each person just to go around the group and, and I want you to share something that you liked and then each person can interact or they can share something that they like, they dislike, and then you can just interact. Okay. So I'm not expecting you to, to that's why we had the lecture. So so the focus of the breakout section, uh, the, the break, breakout session is for you to share what you really like, something that was very significant to you, and then something that maybe you disagreed with, and then if you have a question. So I would like each one to be thinking about that. Nothing more, nothing less, okay? After that, we're going to then discuss, like in the past, we'll have a, a brief discussion about what was shared in the breakout room. So it really kind of orients us so I can hear what the group, what, what you're saying, we can answer some questions. And then we'll go into the notes discussing the reading. And, and we're, we are gonna be sp focusing on some scripture, the scripture as well, uh, that, that is um, going more in depth in the scripture. And then we'll just have a breakout room review and closing prayer. And so you'll go back into your breakout rooms after everything is done tonight and you can have a time of, of review and also closing prayer uh, in that breakout room. 
And so that's really the, that, that's, I, I think that's becoming our standard, our standard um, practice. So at this time, let's go ahead and let's break out into the breakout rooms. Okay, let's, let me uh, share my screen. How was it? Give me some feedback. <laughs> it's <laughs> mind boggling. <laughs> We need more time, Pastor. Kulang pa rin yung time. Pag discussion, it's always kulang. So, so if in an ideal world, is 20 minutes enough or would you still say kulang? Would 20 minutes be better? Kulang. Oh Not my goodness. Not enough, yeah. <laughs> Pastor, Kim, it was really nice to have ideas. I mean, gathering ideas, yeah. hearing. I... Ang ginawa ko nga lang, I, I limit the, the discussion. One point and then your question. Kulang pa rin. <laughs> so, maybe what we can do is, anyway. yeah, anyway, we'll, 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 yeah, maybe we can, if we can be more disciplined to get earlier, we can get, we can give more time. So, <laughs> let's think about it. That's the, that's the, <laughs> that's the give and take. <laughs> Oh my goodness! Oh my goodness! Okay, so um, let's let's do uh, observations first. Okay, all right. So let's go ahead. Your observations first. Let's start with group number. Last time we started in the back, so let's start with group number one. So, uh, Pastor Henry Koyabobo, Koyabobo is the leader, and then also Danny. Okay. Uh, go ahead and just share, maybe one or two observations, and then if you have a question. The, the, the deck is yours. Okay. One common observation was uh, the one uh, we quoted on page 56. Okay. Uh, I quote two sentences. Had God permitted grace freely to flow out into the world and to gather great strength within a short period, then the true nature and consequences of the world of this obscene would have been very imperfect, imperfectly disclosed. Man would have described to his own relative goodness what was in reality a product of the grace of God. Ang observation namin dito is parang God permitted sin to degenerate so man will appreciate the need for a redeemer. Uh, on, my, on my report that I submitted, I relate this to Romans 6.1. Yeah. In Romans 6.1, uh, Paul asked the question, Shall we go on sinning so grace will increase? So, yun ang, yun ang observation ko na this is, uh, to me, this was related to Romans 6.1. Kay Pastor Henry, ang nakita niya na observation is yung linya ni Cain at laka, linya ni Seth na sabi niya, kung hindi sila nag-intermarriage, baka mas lalong malala yung nangyari sa mankind. So in English. <laughs> ah, had, had God not permitted the, the, the lineage of Cain or the, the, the generation of Cain to intermarry with the uh, generation of Seth, the wickedness of man would have been worse than what, was, than what actually happened. While it was already worse, it would have been much worse if the two did not intermarry. That's, that yeah, no, so that's yeah so that's that's a possibility that that's definitely a possibility um i think Voss was saying that that the intermarrying was the climax or maybe i was mistaken maybe we can maybe we can discuss that but r regardless there is a lot of sin going down <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah there's and so and so even though there's judgment, God's grace is, is present. So, so let's put that down here as far as the, um, the uh, intermarriage. But, but, but it's, 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 it is really important for us to see, however we, we see that, that um, it was even wrong. Even if it was permitted, it was still wrong. It was still wrong for them. And I think that's what Henry was saying. It's still wrong. And, and God needed to judge that. Um, but I, I guess it is possible. It is possible that things would have been worse, that that's possible. Um, but we, we need to see that it was not supposed to be. Um, so good. Okay, great. Uh, group number two, group number two, what do you have? Yeah, um, with regards to, to the observation of 
Kuya Buboy. So that's also the thing that uh, uh, which I wrote in my you know, in my in my assignment that I am uh, I don't like about Voster. That seems like Vos is much in in his uh, uh, exegesis of the Genesis four to nine. He just focuses somehow more in the negative of the, or more. He's just focusing more in the negative happening in the in the four to nine uh, of, of Genesis. Uh, he just recorded uh, more, focused more in the rapid development of scene, um, yeah. uh, describes the development of the line of Seth uh, in terms of redemption. Then um, somehow uh, he focused about the pronouncement of judgment, in, in, maybe in the later part of uh, uh, chapter nine, somehow in the yeah. middle of the uh, chapter nine about the capital Chap punishment. Yeah, yeah. Just the death or the de uh, death punish or death penalty, somehow like that. So somehow Voss is more on the negative aspect of in in doing the exegesis of the the four to nine of Book of Genesis. So so that's my that's that's one of my you know, so I will call Pastor Jomar to express uh, his sentiment also with regards to that uh, capital punishment because he 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 saw something like. In the connection between the Genesis and the Leviticus. Pastor Jomar, you are there. Can you explain your side on this and your stand? Yeah, yeah. It's so uh, flattering. Uh, you address me as Pastor Sergius, but uh, I'm not uh, a pastor. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, po, uh, regarding uh, on on uh, boss statement, uh, he said, uh, since I'm using uh, the physical book, uh, it's located page 53, uh, he said, uh, but flesh with life, uh, the, the, uh, but flesh with the life thereof, the blood thereof you shall not eat, this being coupled with the promise uh, of vengeance from animal reveals the point of view. Since the animals are not devoured up man after a carnivorous fashion, man also is not to eat animals as wild beasts devour their living uh, prey. So uh, I think uh, this is pointing to uh, the prohibition of eating the blood of animals because yeah. uh, it uh, of course, uh, relate it to uh, from Genesis 9, uh, verse 6. He said, whoever shed the blood of man, by man shall his blood be shed. For God made man in his own image. I think uh, the Leviticus... Uh, how they took the prohibition of uh, eating the blood because uh, the blood is a symbol of life. Yeah. And uh, it says uh, in Leviticus 17, verse 11, it says, and I have given, for, given it for you an altar to make atonement for your soul. For it is the blood that makes atonement by uh, life. I just, I just want to know uh, why was uh, related to the uh, Genesis 9 verse 6 since uh, Genesis 9 verse 6 it talks about the capital punishment that uh, given by uh, provided by God so that the people uh, yung community po is uh, makuntained but uh, since uh, boss relate uh, to the prohibition of the blood uh, eating the blood of animals uh, I just want to know uh, uh, why it uh, it happened. Yeah. So why? So let's let's discuss that. So what we can at least say is that that's what the text says. So just to be clear here, um, and maybe maybe clarify your question with me, so I don't want to miss miss mishear you, Jomar. So the text says um, that that I've given you uh, nine verse two. And verse three, uh, everything that moves, I've delivered into your hand. As I gave you the green plants, I give you everything. So, meaning to say that they can eat, they can eat, they can eat animals. Okay, but then it says in verse four, but you shall not eat flesh with its life. That is the blood. Okay, so so that's explicit. So that's almost the identical prohibition command as in Leviticus. Diba. So, so the connection would be it's 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 the same command that that command is repeated in Leviticus. Are you tracking with me? 
Jomar? Yes, Pastor Kim. Yeah, so let's discuss that, but is, but is that getting a little bit towards the answer of your question or what is your question? Can you repeat your, the, the, your, your question? Um, I, I didn't really track what you were, you're just asking why he brings up the not eating, the, the prohibition part of, of eating blood? Uh, yes, uh, Pastor Timau. My question is, uh, why, why the prohibition of uh, eating the blood of animals uh, connected yeah. uh, from Genesis 9 verse 6? Or okay, I so just there, missed yeah. I, I included text. that I included that in my in my in the report that I submitted I also made a Okay comment. so 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 I'm still not tracking the question. So because the text says that so the text says you can't eat the blood and then also it says whoever sheds blood by man shall his blood be shed. So are, are, is your question just a question of of why is 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 that is that essentially your question Jomar and and Koyo Boboy? For Genesis 9, 4, and 6? Or is there a, it's something else related to that? Mine was not a question. Mine was an explanation why the prohibition was made or was given. Oh, so you're asking why the prohibition, Jomar? That's the question? I think that's the question of Jomar. Uh, well, my question is why uh, it uh, related or... I just missed the verse four of Leviticus 17. Oh, so now you're making the connection. So now you're seeing the reason why there's the connection is because it's, it's said there. So is that kind of answering the question then? Why it's then connected yes. to Leviticus? Okay, see, see, see. Okay, that's why I would really highly recommend all of us do this. I'm guilty as well. When, when, sometimes when, when boss says something, just go to the text and look. <laughs> Look, because I'm guilty as well. Like, you're like, why is he saying that? And then if you just go and look at the surrounding context, he's not going to explain everything. He's not going to go and really go into, because he's just, again, he's at the academic level and he's assuming that you're very familiar with the text already. And we're not, we're not as familiar as he is. Kuya Bulba, your explanation, let's discuss that when we, when we get to that section in the okay. future, okay? okay. Um, um, okay. Co yeah, coming back here, I, I do want to, I do want to say, um, just a brief answer to Jesus's observation. Um, I think the reason why Voss focuses on the negative is because in actuality, what is the climax? The climax is, um, in, is in uh, Genesis 6 to 8, in which God judges and kills all life. So I, I, I think if we were to say, why does he focus on the negative? It's because, I mean, it's very negative. I mean, God, think about he kills all of life except for one family and one family of each animal. So, so I, I understand the purpose of, because in actuality, Jesus, that was one of my comments that Voss really does focus on the negative component. That's a good observation. And, and, and I think the reason for that is because this is, remember, so his, he's not, it's not a common, we always have to remember this, brothers, sisters. Voss is not giving us everything there is to say. It's not a commentary on Genesis 4 to 9. It's, it's focusing specifically on special revelation and then the new content of special revelation. <laughs> so it's, it's really very focused. And so the new content of special revelation is primarily negative. And, and, and we're going to see that because that, that negativity is really going to be found in Genesis 6, 1 to 6. And that's what Voss really sits down. He like sits down there and talks about that. So this is really the climax. And this is really, if we have shadows, we have types, we have grace mingled with judgment um, in, in these, these passages. But if you were to say, what are, the, what are the theological truths that are being taught? To be honest with you, it's, you, have, you have patterns, you have types that are, gonna, that are gonna be explained later. But if you're saying, what is the theological truth being taught? Really, 
I'm going to make an argument that there is only one. There's one main theological truth, and it's found here. So um, let's be thinking about that. Um, and the point is well taken, Jesus. That's a good observation, that it is primarily negative. And so, you know, um, um, maybe that doesn't sit well with us, but I, I do think that Voss is, is tracking with, 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 with the text. You know, I had to read it again three to four times. I read this three to four times, so I'm the same way as you. Um, um, but let's, let's look at that. I, I do think that there's going to be some good truth that's going to be brought out here. Um, let's go on out. Group number three, what are your observations or questions? I, I just want to take a step back. What has been said so far is excellent. These are really good observations, excellent work in your discussion. So I, I, I'm not minimizing. I really think that these are, these are spot on. These are questions that I had that, that we want to think about. Um, group number three, I think that's the last group. Who was in group number three? It was um, yeah, uh, Claudio and Kea. Go ahead. Oh, okay. Okay, so for us, uh, according to Pastor Claudio, he was, uh, he was talking about the Canaanites and the Sethites. Okay. Uh, he need, that he needs more notes. He agrees on it, that the, the daughters of men are described as the Canaanites and the yeah. Sethites would be the sons of sons of god yeah uh -huh. but he needs more notes on this well i i followed up uh pastor tim a question okay. if both are humans so what are those nephilims <laughs> i mean how yeah. did nephilims appear okay so that was my question and then uh pastor mark uh said that uh his observation is that even though cain sinned god has still provided him grace through his inventions, which was actually the sword. And then <laughs> uh, I, I actually gave another observation, Pastor Tim. Okay, go ahead. That we should not take sin lightly. That yes, is what excellent. I have observed all throughout because I, I have, as they have. Oh, I lost Kaya. Okay, I, sorry, ahead. sorry. Hello. Yes. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, we should not take sin lightly because. Uh, it's like sin is leveling up. It's like yeah. at first it's small and then it goes up. And then it's also uh, written here that sin proves powerful enough to prostitute the gifts of God's common grace in the sphere of nature for purposes of evil. So it, it's very striking in connection with what Pastor Mark said that, that even though God gave that sword, that invention to Cain to protect himself, I mean, Lamech used it for himself. Yeah. So that's how that's how sin is. It's leveling up. So yeah. we should never take it lightly. Yeah. So. No, that's really good. And uh, then, that, uh, go, yes. Yeah. Go ahead. No, no. Go ahead. Continue. Go ahead. Okay. So, so, um, well, uh, I would like to. Uh, I don't know if I, I, I should disagree or what, but I'm really confused. My question also is. Okay. So the question is. Men, I, sorry, men or angels? Um, yes. So, Kaya, don't worry, you're in good company. I have gone back and forth on this, and I actually, for a while, my interpretation from last semester was angels. I, if you go back and watch BT, um, the Bible's big story, I was angels. Voss convinced me I'm back with men. <laughs> <laughs> so, so this is, this would be an example. This would be an example where like debat last night, we discussed Satan's fall. And I really think we should take the conservative view. It's clear. Uh, we should not be debating that as much. This would be an example where we could agree and disagree. <laughs> so, 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 um, and I don't think there's a big difference. Voss says there's a big difference and there, there's an issue there. Fair enough. But I don't think it's a big issue. We can talk about that. I think there's a lot, there's a lot, there's a lot of um, uh, a lot to be said. Um, so what I what I'll just say is that uh, it's debated, okay? And um, and so if you're stressed, I'll give some clues from what Voss kind of implies that kind of push me back to what it's viewing of men, and then. A possible answer that I have. So it's 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 very much an interpretation. We we always have to remember, um, brothers and sisters, that again, this is primeval. This is this is where it's still 
a mystery. It's still hidden. It's still, it's not fully revealed to us. Okay. And so in that sense, you're going to have, we will have answers where the text does not yet answer. And, and that's fine because, because God has not revealed everything yet to us. Some things he has. And so let's, let's look at that. So um, I think those are the groups. So this is great. Thank you for your participation. Um, I'll, I'll try next time to give you a little bit more time so there can be more discussion. Um, but the show must go on. <laughs> the show must go on. So let's look at the, let's go ahead um, and let's look at the PowerPoint. And as we look at the PowerPoint, we are going to look at this text as well, because I want you to see some things. And um, I, I, want, I want you to have confidence in Voss. You know, maybe this was a harder read for you. You know, I did not have a, the first time I read this, I was kind of like, I disagree. Like, like, I was like, hey, Suze, like, why is Voss focusing on this? After the third or fourth reading, I really started to understand. And so, um, you know, um, my one professor used to say this, you're always going to get, when, when, when the, the pastor, when the theologian, he's going to give you brick and sand. There's going to be brick and sand. Just find the brick. <laughs> you just get rid of the sand, get rid of the rocks, keep the brick. Okay, so um, there's going to be things you're going to disagree. There's going to be things that are going to be hard. Um, and so, you know, our goal, and this is, this is really where I want to emphasize this. We're, we're using Voss as a pattern because I do think that he, he has a lot of good things to say, but we should not be committed to him before the scripture. So if something is not making sense in Voss, and even after class, you don't feel it makes sense, that's fine. You should not choose Voss just because it's Voss. You should choose Voss because it, when you look at the word of God, you're like, okay, I see that. I, I, I do believe this is what the word of God is saying. Okay, let's go with what he says. If, if it's still unclear to you, you should, you should not choose boss just because it's boss. Okay, I, I, want, I want to stress that. All right, let's go ahead and let, let me share my PowerPoint. All right, so chapter number five, the mode and content of special revelation during the Noachian period. Okay, and so what I do want to say by way of introduction, as I mentioned before, uh, he's not saying everything there is to say. And I think if we have that expectation, it'll make a lot more sense. He's giving us something new. And so um, what is that new thing that he's giving? Number one and number two, the reality is, is that if this ends, in the judgment of Adam and Eve, they were all judged, but no one died. There was this grace. This judgment ends in catastrophic death. So in many ways, this judgment is, is, is at a whole different level um, than Adam and Eve's judgment, even though they still will die. The, 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 there's a promise of eventual death. In this judgment, life is taken like that. Um, so uh, we are now, we are continuing in uh, part number three, the history of Revelation. And so we're on part number three, A, the mode and content of special revelation in the Old Testament. And we're on to point number three, the mode and content of special revelation during the Noahic, the, the, the Noahic period. And what we're going to do here is just the overview of what we'll be looking at. Number one, we will, we will have an overview of this period. So we'll look at some, some big picture ideas. We're going to look at the progress of revelation climaxing in judgment. So this is the direction of the text. It climaxes in judgment. And so... Uh, we should be expecting revelation to be moving along that realm. This is not a situation where there's a lot of goodness and man is growing in, in obedience. It's that there's a lot of badness that all of mankind is sinning, except for, as it turns out, a, a very few amount of men, the line of Seth. And, and by the time of Noah, he's the last. So this is not a, this is not a time period of, of spiritual revival, of spiritual growth. This is a, t a time period of spiritual degradation, destruction, and pure wickedness, okay? Um, then there is this, no way, um, there is the, this cataclysmic judgment, but then there is this saving and preserving of the human race and creation for something greater. And so then we transition into the Noachian revelation. So that's the, that, that's the, the next big part of of this portion here. And then I do, I am adding, uh, I am adding connections back to Genesis, Revelation connections. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, uh, Revelation foundation. So 
I'm highlighting some of those themes that, that Voss brought out in Genesis. He didn't necessarily explain, but I'm going to highlight them for us. And so Voss is focusing on new content, but I'm going to be taking some of Voss's principles, the principle of life, of death, of temptation, of judgment mingled with grace. And we're going to highlight some of those things. Uh, e is also going a little bit deeper. So I'm going to add one other new concept. I don't have E here. It's, it'll be later in the slide. But we're also looking at this one new concept that uh, we'll be looking at. There's echoes of it in Genesis. It's more distinct in um, especially uh, Genesis uh, 6 to 9. I should say seven to nine, seven, chapter seven to nine. And, um, and it's actually fundamental to our theology of who Christ is, who that promised seed is from the Proto-Evangelium. Overview of this period. So there's two features that Voss highlights. So, um, uh, so this kind of gets to the questions as well. Um, there's two features. Number one, the growth and expansion of man's sin the growth and expansion of man's sin. And, and uh, I don't think anyone can disagree with that. I don't think anyone can disagree with that. And, and, and we'll, see, we'll see why it is that this is the case. Um, and then number two, the level of corruption of the human heart. Uh, so of everything else, Noah is righteous, but we don't really know what's going on behind the scene. Last week, we looked at Hebrews 11, and Hebrews 11 says that what was going on behind the scenes is Noah had faith. If Noah has faith, he has God's spirit living within him. Uh, and and he's, um, so, you know, when, when we look here, that, that's not really clear. What is really clear if you read, and this is why I had you read the reading that you did, that you had to do the scripture reading on Genesis chapter four to nine, what is really being accented here throughout is number one, the growth and expansion of man's sin and the level and corruption of man's heart. Those are the two major themes of, of Genesis chapter four to Genesis chapter to chapter nine. And I want to try to prove it to you tonight and highlight those things. And there is a positive component. So we, we do see this judgment mixed with grace, but fundamentally, the two main features are th this negative. And this is, th these two points are brought from Voss, and I, and I agree with him on that. You really see the sin of Adam and Eve and even Satan is, is, is small compared to what will happen in the future. And, and, and the issue of the heart, the issue of the heart. Voss says this, before the work of redemption is further carried out, the downward tendency of sin is clearly illustrated in order that subsequently in light of this downgrade movement, the true divine cause of the upward course of redemption might be appreciated. So what Voss is not saying, what the word of God is not saying is that God is endorsing sin. Okay, that's not what's being said here. What's being said here is that God could have sent the Messiah right after, right? Seth could have been the Messiah and it would have all been over. But, but instead, instead God waited for the fullness of time to send his Messiah. And, and in his grace, in his providence, he allowed man to become who he is by nature. Does everyone see that? So once man has fallen, once man has fallen, he now, um, God is going to allow him to reveal himself for, for who he is. This would be similar to, to my daughter, who um, I command her not to touch the stove. Okay, I'm there. And she goes over to touch the stove, and I let her touch the stove so that she burns herself, but that she could learn a lesson. Okay, and so God does this. God allows us to sin. Sometimes he holds the hand from sin. So Abimelech, God prevents him from sinning, right, against him. He would have taken his life, okay? Okay. Uh, David, he allowed, he allowed David to sin. Um, and so Israel, he allowed them to sin. So, so there's different reasons for why God allows us, but he is not the author. He's merely allowing us be, to be who we are for his greater purpose. All right. So the big takeaway here is that in, if God were to send grace and prevent this downward spiral, that would have been great. That would have been grace. Okay. Mercy is not getting what we deserve. 
the giving of grace and preventing would actually be <laughs> beyond that. Okay, so so we need to keep this in re this 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 reality in check. God could have just let God could have said, "I'm not going to be involved at all," and then man would have just been it would have been like an even greater spiral. Okay, this is what's being said here. I I hope this is making sense. Does, let's take a pause. Does anyone have a question or someone want to add? Okay, let's move on here. Let's move on here. The mode of God's communication with mankind still appears to be direct as exemplified in Enoch, Cain, and Noah. And so after the, the new setup, after the, the, the judgment, God's going to communicate in a different way. Up until here, it seems that God is still directly communicating with man. So God is being gracious by still, he, right? God reasons with Cain. He didn't have to. He could have just struck him dead. Um, but God is gracious to Cain. And in the words of Voss, Cain prostitutes. Cain prostitutes grace. Cain prostitutes grace. Uh, very strong language. And that's what happens. It's, it's very grotesque. Um, but, but Cain takes and his family takes insane advantage of, of, of God's grace. And we're going to, we're going to see that B the progression of revelation climaxing with judgment. So now we're going to look at this progression of revelation climaxing with judgment. So Voss is going to highlight three stages for us. Number one, the rapid development of sin in the line of Cain. So we're going to look at that. Okay. Uh, we'll actually look at that. I'll, I'll, I'll highlight these. We'll look at Cain and then we'll take a break. Okay. Because it's already, it's, it's already past seven o'clock. Okay. Number two, the development and intercourse of the line of Seth with God. So running parallel as Cain's line rapidly um, uh, is out of control, going down in sin. There is this growth of, in, of development of, of dependence um, in, in a salvific sense, we're going to see it's in a salvific sense, an intercourse with the line of Seth, um, uh, with, the, with the line of Seth with God, okay? But what happens is, is when these two combine, instead of the, the, the line of Cain following the line of Seth, the line of Cain corrupts, the, the line of Cain corrupts the line of Seth, and then we have this great statement of, of regret by God. We have this great statement of judgment. And we also have this great statement of what is in the heart of man. Yeah. So let's, 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 let's look at that. And then, and then point number three is, um, there it is, the commingling of the Canaanite Sethite line through intermarriage. And it's at this time that God determines to kill everyone. Okay. So um, this does seem to be like a downward spiral and by the end, there's only one man that's faithful. Even in the line of Seth, there's only one man that's faithful. And then the climax is this judgment pronounced upon everyone. Okay. So, so that's the climax there. That should be Genesis 6, 5 to 6. Okay. So this is, this is the three stages that climax with judgment. Okay. So it, it, it seems to be this um, uh, spiraling downward effect. Uh, yeah. It's really great, clear that... Um... Um, at least in chapter five of Boss, he um, emphasizes the judgment, yeah. you know, the actual judgment. Um, yeah, no, no, you know, it's just, I uh, just learned that a uh, Voss is, uh, we cannot understand Voss when we read it, you know, um, today I read, you know, a page, so on, so, and then we will continue later. But if you look at the, uh, you finish that whole chapter and then, and connect to the first chapter, you can see that even Voss is not really focusing on on sin, but he also concluded with God's grace. Yeah. Uh, in, in, in actually in my book, I'm, I'm reading the, the physical book in in, in um, pages page sixty five. He yeah. he laid down two things that I have observed. Number one, the 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 judgment of God is is always in the virtue of His sovereignty. Yep. sovereignty and and the reason why he he pronounced judgment in chapter four to, to nine or judgment there is because that the, the majesty as according to voss the divine majesty is assaulted yeah is assaulted because if yeah. you look at also the chapter 14 you can see that um you know man or adam himself sided with satan 
Yeah. So yeah. So that's that's what that's right. You know, so, now that, that, and, that's a good observation. And so in this line of Seth and the line of Cain, we should be thinking about one line is sided with God and the other is actually Satan is working behind the scenes in this this seed as well. And so maybe that also yeah. gets at gets at answering the question about the the, the Nephilim. The fallen one. So great observation, Sonny. And um, good. A anyone else want to add? Anyone else want to add? I am convinced, Pastor Tim. <laughs> What's that about? I am, yeah, about it's either it's men or angels. Yeah, I, I'm going for men. <laughs> they really yeah. are men. Yes. And then I have seen here, uh, I have understood now how God got, got so mad. I mean, his wrath. Mm -hmm. It's because it it's really an insult, the co-mingling. Yeah. Now I understand it. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. You're welcome. So let's 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 yeah. go deeper. Oh, go ahead, go ahead, Bobby. Uh, initially, that was also my long-standing question when I started reading Genesis. Uh, why did God allow this to happen without any interruption, and then only up to the time of Noah did He said, okay. That's enough. And then allowed again sin to deteriorate again and again. And they say, okay, it's time for the Messiah to come. That was also my very, very hard question then. And uh, it seems I, I could not I could not fathom the answer every time they explain something like that. But somehow uh, it seems there is now an, a better explanation that Boss is offering. Yeah. And it's very, it's even more difficult to accept that God allows it to happen yeah. because he has a purpose, a grace. Yeah. That's, that's the, that's yeah. the mind-bungling no, uh, no. logic. Why would sin deter deteriorate to that level only to, be only to appreciate God's grace? That's yeah. a mind-bungling logic. No, it's, it's hard. And so there's two levels, right? First, first, the first level is trying to understand what, so you're asking the question, what what and then once you have that answer it's like why <laughs> so once you get once you once we re recognize this is what god has ordained the question is really like you know um it, 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 at the end of the day it's it's a question of 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 faith do we trust that god is more wise than us and his way is more perfect and and can we rest in that or will we assume the position of God and judge his actions. That, that, that's, that's hard. That's hard. But that's where it comes down to. Okay, let's, let's go back and let's look at the text. So I want us to see, I want these four major points. I really want to see this in the text. And I want to, I want to draw some highlights to you because, because there is, I do want us to really see this. These are great statements. And maybe someone will say, they're great statements, but do we see this in the text? And I want us to really see this in the text. So let's go ahead. I'm going to um, open your Bibles now, if you have your Bibles with you. And um, okay, so we're, everyone can see Genesis 4. Okay, so um, what I, every, I'm assuming most read, so I'm not going to reread. We don't have the time. I'm just going to go through and highlight some things. And some things that I highlight will be the same as if you took the Bible's big story some of those things are the same, are, are, will be similar, okay, because there's overlap here, okay? We, we are focusing on God's revelation and this storyline, okay? So just looking here, Genesis 4, 1, we have this statement, I have gotten a man with the help of the Lord. And so this here is really signifying, this is signifying the, the faith, of of eve uh it's it's the lord who's helping her and that's going to be different than what we'll see with the line of the line of of cain okay um and also this i have gotten that's a reference to the offspring so here we're seeing we're seeing faith and and trust going on okay coming down here we see uh there, there's this, we don't have a lot of information, but we have this, we know there's a command that we need to be um, offering to, 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 to the Lord. So Cain brings an offering and so does, 
so does uh, Abel. And, and all we know is that God accepts, God accepts Abel's offering, but does not accept Cain's offering. That's, 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 all, we, that's all we have. That, that's all we know. There's, there's not much more. You see here that God in his grace, the Lord in his grace, this is, this is grace. This is grace, and this is special revelation. Does everyone see that here? God is, is warning him about, now look at this. God is warning him about sin and this desire that seems to be internal in man's nature. Okay, and there's this call to, to be disciplined. Okay, we don't know much more than that. But this is, this is God revealing to, to, uh, and giving a warning to Cain, okay? Cain does not, does not heed the warning of God. And Cain goes out and he kills his brother. Okay? The Lord, the Lord comes, just like Adam and Eve, right? The Lord comes. What did you do? <laughs> what, did, what happened? What happened, right? What happened? And here... There is no, there is no uh, hint of remorse, repentance, or even acknowledgement. He just, it's like, there's, there's no regard. And in many ways, this is worse. This is worse than Adam and Eve. Does everyone see that? And this is, this is murder here. So let's be clear that the first sin was taking a fruit and disobeying God. The next sin is murder. It's like that escalated really quick. <laughs> that, that, that went really quick. <laughs> it was like a whole other escalation. Okay. Um, uh, God, the Lord curses him. The Lord curses him, but he doesn't take his life. Does everyone see that? So the Lord curses Cain. Now, now look here. Cain, the, God, the Lord curses Cain, and Cain's response, look at Cain's response here. The punishment is greater than I can bear. There's zero sorrow, there's zero remorse for the death of his brother. The whole focus is upon himself. And is this not what, is this not what the, um, the, the, the problem of, of choosing our own path, this is completely self-centered and self-focused. He is self-focused, okay? There's no concept of what he's done to someone else. He's really hardened in his mind, okay? Look at this. He asks, he kills his brother and he asks for mercy. He asks for mercy from, from God. Someone's going to kill me. Notice he, he kills... He kills his brother, and then, and then God doesn't take his life, but he curses him. And then he, his, complaint is, his complaint is, God, because of what you've done, someone's going to kill me. It's like, <laughs> just craziness. This is craziness. It's like he killed someone, and then God's like, okay, I'm not going to take your life, but you're cursed. You're going to be a wanderer. He's like, someone's going to kill me. It's like, you think? <laughs> but look at this. Look at this. This is the grace of God. Look at God's common grace. Look at this. This is why Voss says grace is prostituted. Grace is, I mean, this is so offensive, okay? So God gives, God gives common grace and supernaturally, he supernaturally protects Cain from death. Do you think Cain would show any type of gratitude? No. Look at this. This shows this. Okay, so Voss is saying the degradation, the downward side of man. Adam and Eve were forced out of the garden and they had to put flaming cherubims, cherubs, right? To keep them from coming back because they want to be with God, right? Everyone's, does everyone see that? 
God has to guard the garden so Adam and Eve will not come back, okay? Because they can't be in his presence, all right? Look here. Cain leaves. Cain leaves the presence of God. Verse 16, then Cain went away from the presence of God. Cain voluntarily leaves the presence of God. I'm getting goosebumps just saying that. Imagine that. The depth of depravity, just one generation. There is this, there is, there, there is not even this desire to like, God, I've done wrong. Please forgive me. I want to be back in your presence. This, this should scare everyone. Cain went away voluntarily from the presence of God. Cain knew his wife. She conceived and bore Enoch. And so he, he, too, he too builds a city. And the implication being that he's not, pers he's not pursuing God's image. I mean, God's presence. They're living on their own. So th this here is living. We can say this in... Um, uh, living on their own as gods, right? So the whole the whole temptation in the in the garden was to become wise like God, be become independent of God, making your own decisions. So here we're seeing this brought to fruition, living fully on their own in their own city apart from God. Okay, and then there's just a. a description of going down through history and then you come to the seventh you come to the seventh generation here okay now look at this look at this um they have their they're a forger of of instruments of bronze and iron so these people are gifted these people have gifts look what lamech sings hear my voice you wives of Lamech. So already here, we said this last semester, already here you have polygamy now. <laughs> They've already corrupted marriage. Does everyone see that? It's corrupted. Right? Therefore shall man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto, unto his wife and they shall be one flesh. Jesus reiterates that. God's design, God's law, God's, God's command, God's revealed will is one, one wife, one man. And here we have polygamy. So every, every aspect is being corrupted, okay? Um, here he's, here he's, um, uh, this is written in, this is written in poetry. So this would be, this would be a song. Look at this. Cain at least had some form of, as bad as it was, right? Here he says, I killed a man for wounding me. And, and, and you know, we could look at the different interpretations. We could say essentially, this is, this is like, um, this is like offending me. So at least with Cain, at least with Cain, there was deep bitterness that God was accepting his brother and not him. At least Cain is striving for the affection of God, okay? And so that mattered to Cain, and when God did not accept him, he, it led him to murder. So not to justify in any way Cain's act, at least you could say, okay, it was a big deal. God didn't accept him. Of course, there's something bad in his heart. Fair enough. But at least he's striving for something great being accepted by God. Here, this is just offense. <laughs> He's killing out of offense. And there's no, there, there's absolutely no remorse. He's actually saying if, if Cain's revenge is, is, is um, sevenfold, Lamex is 70-fold. This is pure um, pride, uh, boasting, no fear of God. So chapter four is rightly called um, 
we could say big picture here, chapter four, the downward, that's what, that's what Voss used, downward. Downward slide of the line of Cain. That's, that's chapter four in a nutshell, right? You're just seeing it go down. It's just going down, 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 okay? Um, it's 7.30. Let's take a break and let's come back and let's talk about the, the godly Cain uh, the godly line of Seth. The godly line of Seth. Any uh, questions before we do a break? Before any, any the break, questions? can we ask? Can I ask a question? Uh, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. Let's let's please uh, show uh, Genesis four seventeen. I have heard this question and debate many times, and it seems there is no resolution. God knew his wife. Where did that wife came from? Yeah. <laughs> so. So, you know, liberals would say, see, there's more than one people. There's, there's other races. This is not literal, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. My, my perspective is this, and maybe you'll accept it, maybe you won't. Um, for sure, Adam and Eve had more sons than, than uh, Cain, Abel, and Seth. They probably had hundreds of sons. To say that Adam lived 900 years and only had three sons, it's not possible. It's just not possible. You know, I would say that's really impossible. I mean... If we know, if we know the, the desire of man. Um, so what I would say is that there's probably a lot more children, a lot more children. And, and this is over years and years and years and years, hundreds of years. Okay. So, so there's, there's a lot more children that's not being described. And the reason for that is these are like patriarchs. These are like leaders in the family, but it's not comprehensive. It's most fundamental, but not comprehensive. And so for sure, I could see Cain when he left the presence of God, taking one of maybe, maybe uh, so, so, someone in the family and them going and then them having a family and then they're all intermarrying. So um, maybe you don't like that answer. Um, but the bottom line is this, Koya Boy, if it was important for us to know, the word of God would have revealed it to us. The fact that that is not on the purview of the author, nor in the rest of scripture, I would say that's a very interesting question. We could discuss it, but I think that it's, 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 a, it's a question that's um, in the background, not in the foreground. And, I and the other thing I would say, the other thing I would say is that it's only, it's only debated in a modern context. I really haven't seen it debated in like, Jewish context, no doubt Jewish people would have had this question unless they recognize these are leaders in the family and it's not comprehensive. And, and I think that's the most reasonable thing. And if you think about it, within 200, think about this, within 100 years, you can have a lot of children. Once it's multiplying, within 200 years, you can have, I mean, it just, everyone's multiplying a child a year. And, and during this time, just to be clear, this is not when the genetic, our genetic code, this is more scientific. It's not weak. It's very strong. So we are, we are becoming more sickly as, as, we, as our genes spread out. And, 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 you know, I'm not a genetic expert, but, but I'm pretty sure that when you go back in time, our, genetic, our genetics are much stronger. And the proof is that you could intermarry way back when and not have all the genetic defects that you have now. Um, and so I'm not, I'm not uh, a scientist in the area of genetics and biology, but I would say that there was probably a lot less death in childbirth and, and ch children dying just because they were just perfect and then they just fell. And so the, you know, they're living 900 years. So their genetic, their genetic code is much stronger. Their genes are much stronger. So the growth can be astro exponential compared to, compared to today. And, and that's just beyond. Any other questions or comments or follow-up? Yeah, I, I, th I think we should, we should see that. But, but, but I do think that the, these are more highlights. We need to be thinking these are highlights. This is not, this is not a historical account um, in its most literal, like giving us comprehensive information. It's giving us fundamental information, not, not comprehensive. Fundamental, not comprehensive. So yeah. really good question, Kuri Boboy. Really good question. Um, anyone else want to add? Anyone else want to add before we take our break? 
So now we're on to Genesis chapter four into chapter five. So we're going to look now really briefly at all of chapter chapter five. Okay. So the first major point, just to review what Voss says, it, it describes the rapid development of sin in the light of Cain. And I think we clearly see it and, and that's being accented in the context. Okay. I, I think that, I think that's clear. And so now the, the second major movement is the development in the line of Seth. So let's look at how the line of Seth develops. Right now, we don't know how many, we're not looking at quantity of people, we're just looking at quality. That is, sin is, if everyone can just check there. So we're looking at quality, not necessarily quantity. We don't know how many are the actual offsprings. We're looking at patriarchs in the family, and we're looking at really the quality. And so we're seeing an incredibly poor quality, incredible form of sin, incredible form of sin in the line of Cain. So looking at the line of, of Adam in, through Seth, it says that Adam knew his wife again. She bore a son and called his name Seth. God has appointed another offspring instead of Abel. And so again, here, we just, I want to really draw this out that we see here we really see here the, the faith of Eve. I hope you see the faith of Eve. It's really accented here. She could have hated that you could have, you, you know, the context describes bitterness in, in, in different individuals. All that we, we know here is the, is the faithfulness and um, the faith of Eve, okay? Uh, what we see here is this very interesting phrase. At, at that time, people began to call upon the name of the Lord. So, those of you who I had for the Bible's big story, what famous passage of scripture is will quote this? What famous passage of scripture will, will quote this? Now, it's quoted in the Psalms. It's also quoted in the prophets. So, the New Testament passage is picking up probably the prophet or, or, or the Psalms statement, but this is the prototype. This is the prototype. Um, what famous New Testament gospel passage, so famous, that, that sounds just like this. At that time, people began to call upon the name of the Lord. What passage of scripture, for those of you who are evangelists, all of us should know this. What passage? Anyone? Book of Acts. Okay, Acts is very Book close. Acts. Very close, Acts. So Acts also says the same thing. But I, I'm still, I'm, I guess I'm looking for the most famous passage. They say it's in, uh, it's in the Romans Road. I'm giving you a big hint. You should draw, you should write a connection down here. Um, anyone, anyone from Romans, Gospel. Response to the gospel. Ah, come on. From my class last semester, if you only learned one thing, why? Oh my goodness. Romans 10, 13. Romans 10. I'm going to read it. Romans 10, verse 9. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified and is saved. For the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord is Lord over all, bestowing his riches on all who call him. For everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Romans 10, 13. Write that down. If ever. I ask this question again from this passage and you get it wrong. I, oh my goodness, I'm gonna be so upset. This is, if ever there is a, a description of salvation of someone who is placing their complete trust in the Lord, to call upon the name of the Lord is to put your trust. You're saying, I cannot save myself. I'm asking you. I, I'm reaching out, right? There's this, in, in boss's term, religious intercourse. 
Okay. So I want to I want to stress this so highly. Romans 10 13. For whose for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. At that time, people began to call upon the name of the Lord. They are this is this is a reference to what Hebrews 11, you can also write Hebrews 11 here as well. Here, <clears throat> the outward call is a sign of the inward faith, okay? This is exegetical. This is exegetical, okay? And so what I want us to see here is that there is no other salvation. <laughs> salvation is by grace through faith alone, okay? Everyone tracking there with me? And we see it in the most, uh, uh, earliest fundamental stage of cr Christian history, it's here. The New Testament is not a second way of salvation. It's not a new gospel. <laughs> it's here. You can see that. Okay, so I want to stress this. I want to stress this. I want to emphasize this. Never, ever let me catch you. I ask you, <laughs> and you do not know the answer. Everyone needs to know the answer, okay? You need to memorize this, memorize Romans 10, 13. There's other, so there's a lot of references like that throughout the Old Testament and the, and the prophets and the Psalms, but Romans is the most famous and the climax, and this is the, this is the beginning, okay? I should go like this. So it's G Genesis 4, 26. It's pointing to Romans 10, 13, okay? All right, I'm going to move on. I, I'm sorry. I, I, I beat my dead horse. I, I be, beat the dead horse, okay? Uh, next, we see here that when God created man, he made him in his likeness. So here we see a connection of man being made in the likeness of God. And look here, we have a connection here with a son in his own image. So... So if we're looking here, just so that everyone's tracking here, God has made man in his likeness, and then man fathered a son in his in his likeness. Okay? And it's not, it's not Cain. It's Seth. Does everyone see that? So with these connections here, maybe this is not as clear as you would like. We, we could say explicitly in the text, this is one of the reasons for me, for me changing my position on the sons of God, that there is a connection in God to man to Seth, where we could say the, 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 the sons of God. Does everyone see that? And it's not, uh, Cain is not here. It doesn't refer to Cain. You would have thought Cain would have been placed here, but it's not. Okay? So this would be one clue that would, would strongly suggest that Genesis 6, sons of God, you see that connection. God creates man after his own likeness. Man creates a son and so by implication, this, this could also infer in um, faith, the faith of, 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 of Adam. Now, maybe you're saying it's too much, Tim, you're reading into it. Okay, fine. You know, more, I'll, I will admit it's more my interpretation, but I, I do think that we will, I do think that we have, um, that, that Adam repented. I do think Eve did as well. You don't have any description. This might be as an argument from silence, but you have no description of of Adam's degradation, like the line of, of, of Cain. And in fact, Adam's next son is, is godly. Seth is godly. Okay. Um, so again, not in the story. Okay. So not putting aside the possibility of what, what I talked with, with uh, Koya Bullboy about as far as other children. So I want to be fair there. Uh, and then just moving along here, you have you have just these these fathers and and having children, until we get to um, we get to Enoch. 
And, and we notice here with Enoch that there is several references to Enoch walking with God. And this is not, we should not, and, and Voss argues for this, this is not moral uh, purity, although this would be in, this would be implied because we talk about like walking righteously. I, it's not an either or, okay? But when we say fundamentally, when the scripture says walk with God, of course, there's an implication that he had to be morally pure to walk with God. But, but what we want to see is this is emphasizing, um, this is emphasizing intercourse in the words of Voss or relationship. Everyone tracking there with me? And, and so this is in the same sense of, we could talk about presence of God. So God walks in the garden. And it's stated twice. Okay. So of course, if this is fundamental, there is a sense in which there must be, of course, right, righteousness. And, 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 and morality, right? Cain's a profane man. L Lamech is a profane man. So I'm not saying it's an either or. I'm just saying what's most fundamental, what is this implying? And it's not fundamentally that he was just morally pure, okay? And that's what Voss brings out. What this is emphasizing is Enoch is in divine intercourse with God. He is communicating with God. Is everyone tracking there with, with what, what's being said? Um, <clears throat> moving along here, uh, you have more people that are, that are, that are um, Methuselah, then you have Lamech, and then what he names his son Noah, and I want to get this right here. Noah sounds like Right, you know rest, no, rest, rest. Yeah, okay, that's what I thought. I want to make sure. Yeah, so it sounds and, and means rest. Okay. Um, and so, and so think about the faith. This is huge faith of the father, right? He believes that Noah is going to, and then he says this explicitly. Does everyone see that here? This is, this is, uh, this is belief. Belief in the proto Ivan. Gellium. Does everyone see that? It doesn't say it explicitly, but that's the implication. There was great faith in naming his son Noah. He's saying this one is going to be the one that's going to save us, that God's going to use to save us. Any questions or comments? Everyone sees that? Uh, Dean. Yeah, go ahead. Did God, during the time of Adam, when Adam sinned, did God curse the ground? Or God said to Adam, by, by sweat, you will labor on the ground. Yeah, so, so God cursed the ground. So let me just read. I'll just read what, what it actually says. So God did, in fact, curse the ground. And so that maybe that's a hard thing for us to think about. But it says here, because, um, because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree, which I commanded you, you shall not eat. Cursed is the ground because of you. So he really does curse the ground. Cursed is the ground because of you. And then it talks about how it's going to produce thorns and thistles. And, and in, in Romans 8, it also says that creation was subject to futility because of us. And so it's waiting for the adoptions of sons. And so there really is this idea that... that um, Creation was cursed because of man. Because remember, creation is underneath man's, um, um, all of creation and man were under the Adamic covenant. And when man falls, that curse is extended to, to, to all. So it's, it's Mahirap Talaga. It's really Mahirap. Um, okay, <clears throat> so that's chapter five. So we, so we could say here, we could say here in chapter five that this is the, the we could say this is the in the words of Voss, 
I don't want to misspeak here, the words of Voss, the development of the godly line of Seth. Everyone sees that, right? Everyone sees that? So chapter four, incredible sin. Chapter five, we're seeing, we're seeing, we don't know, we don't know how many, okay? But we're clearly seeing that there is a godly line that's doing what's right, that's in relationship with God, okay? Chapter six, now we're going to really get to, we're going to really get to um, the heart of the issue, okay? So this is hard. We're not going to say everything there is to say. I'll highlight some of the things. Looking here, Voss says that the sons of God, the, this is the, the godly line of Seth. And, and that does make the most sense. That makes the most sense because we saw Seth as coming from man, coming from Adam, and Adam coming from God. So that makes sense. And we also know theologically that angels cannot procreate. And this is the daughters of man. So, so this is the connection that Voss brings out. The daughters of man, if you recall, man or we could say Cain is aligned with the serpent at this point. Is everyone tracking there with me? Whereas the, the, the godly line of, of Seth is aligned with God, okay? And we saw that, chapter five, it's clear. They, they're calling upon the name of the Lord. They're walking with God. They have faith that Noah is going to be the one that's going to save them. What it says here though, which is very sad, is that these sons of God take the the, 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 the daughters of, of, of man. And so Voss says that this is, this is a, a, a co-mingling marriage. Now, many people will say this is a reference to angels. And I held this position up until just recently, okay? And, and, when you read the New Testament, it does seem to, to, to indicate that this was strange flesh. So there are issues. There are inter, um, uh, interdependent issues, in, in, intertextual issues. So, um, you know, if, if you feel it's more angels, that, that's fine. But it does seem to be that um, God's, God's godly line, the godly line offspring from the, the, the woman, that is those aligned with God, marry the daughters of man, those that are aligned with the serpent. And it's because of this, this is kind of, this is, it seems to be perhaps the capstone, the capstone of sin. And you could say, well, why is that the case? Because, because of this, if you look here, because of this, God's response is, my spirit will not abide with man forever. <laughs> so do you see, this is, this, is God's, this is God's response to this behavior. So, so his spirit will not abide, or we can use another word here. This is what Voss will say. This would be remain. And ultimately what Voss brings out is that what the Bible teaches is that man's life um, 
is from God and sustained by him. So in Genesis 2, God breathes his spirit into man and he becomes a living, a living soul, a, a life. Okay? So, so God determines because of the increase of this seems to be, this seems to be here an, an increase of sin too far for God. He says, I have to stop this. Now, if you were to say this is angels, it's even a higher, it's even at a higher level. Okay. If, if it's angels, that's even a more corruptible level, right? If you see sons of God as angels, it's even at a worse level. Okay. And so if you were to see this as angels, you would say, you would say here that this interpretation would be um, uh, fallen angels. And these would be in line with, with the serpent are now corrupting the daughters of man. Okay. And so um, this is leading to the Nephilim. This is literally fallen ones, literally in, in Hebrew fallen ones. Okay. And again, you had the reference to sons of God, daughters of man. Okay. So I think, I think whether you see angels or if you see the line of Seth, the, the bottom line is that this is like this is like a sin too far. God says, okay, I got to stop this. This is out of control. Okay? And, and the, connection, the connection is this. The connection is this. Look at what's happening here. The Lord saw that the wickedness was great upon the earth. So Voss would say here, so this is, this is the first thing that God sees. Number one, that wickedness is uh, great upon the earth. Number two, every intention of the thoughts of his heart, <laughs> every intention of the thoughts of his heart was what? Only, only evil continually. And to our knowledge, there's only one man that remains good. Even though, they're call, even though the godly line of Seth has been calling upon the name of the Lord, when it, the, the degradation gets so bad, um, God, the, the Lord says, look at the response. The Lord regrets. Now, where have we seen, this is from my other class and also, where have we seen this before? Where is this verb accented? Where? Creation. Creation, Ray gets the gold star. The Lord saw that it was good, right? It, it's repeated six times. After each of his creative acts, after man, it's, it's, it's good. Now we see here the king, the judge. This is God functioning as the Lord functioning as judge. He's looking at the acts of man, and he's seeing this. And the conclusion is that this is the ultimate conclusion. Judgment. But there is one exemption, right? But, but Noah found favor in God's eyes. We can say this is also grace. The word is grace, the Hebrew for grace. So coming back up here, coming back up here, what I want to focus upon, I don't want to get into a big debate over who the sons of God are, okay? There is, there is significance in what they, what they are. We can go back and forth. What I want us to focus upon is this.
this is this is giving us revel this is this is really focus the focus is really here god saw the wickedness of man was great on the earth and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually and therefore the judge must act and he must bring judgment okay but what i see here is that this is a climactic statement and this is fundamentally a uh, revelation to us concerning the condition of mankind now people will say oh it's just in this era it's just in this era it's not all the time but after the flood look at what the lord says i i would make a reference here after the flood the lord says this verse uh chapter 8 verse 21 when the Lord smelled the pleasing aroma, the Lord said in his heart, I will never again curse the ground because of man. For the intention of man's heart is evil from his youth. So this is not a unique situation. This is fundamentally our state. This is for all men. So Genesis Chapter 8, verses, Genesis chapter 8, verses uh, 21. At this point, you would say, well, what about Noah? Noah must be the exception. He must have earned God's favor. And we talked about that last week. We would say, absolutely not. What, what this reveals to us, if anything else, is that God supernaturally worked in Noah to bring about his redemptive plan. So Noah is not the exemption. Noah is actually proof that if every single man is wicked, every single man's heart is only evil continually, is it simply because Noah was smarter than the rest? He was not affected by the fall? No. What, we, what we'll see later in theology, what we'll see later in the Revelation in New Testament, that this is the condition for all. For every man, without exception, you could go, the most clearest example would be Romans, or Romans 3, verses 9 to 20, to 20, okay? This is the condition of all of mankind. The reason why Noah isn't like this is because God has done a supernatural work in his life to bring about his greater purpose. Is everyone tracking there with me? And we saw that, we saw that in Hebrews 11, and we'll see that in, in Paul's teaching on, 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 on human nature and the condition of mankind. We mentioned Romans 3, 9 to, 9 to 20. You can look at that in your own time. You could also look at Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 to 4. It says much of the same thing. Jesus talks about the hardness of man's heart as well, Okay. So we would not say Noah is the exemption. We would say, wow, we see the work of God supernaturally in Noah to, to, to still save, to, to be faithful to his promise, to, to, to redeem mankind. Okay? Any questions? Let me take a step back. Anyone that want to ask a question? Is that making sense? Uh, so Tim, looking at yeah. the text or the context of the, the chapter, this chapter, yeah. uh, I don't know if uh, I'm right, but uh, is was Noah a descendant of Shemites? You know those who called the name of the Lord uh, during that time. Well, so so and, Shem so Shem is the son of of Noah. Oh yes. Yeah. yeah so so Noah's ah. so yeah so Shem would be <laughs> would be a follower of Noah. Good. Ah. Good, good, yeah, good yeah, to be the things yeah. that, uh, Described in chapter five, the one who calls on. Oh, Seth. 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 Yeah, so uh, yes, yes, sorry, 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 no, no, okay, I got, I got you. It was just a, a typo in, in our mind. Um, yeah, no, so, okay. so clearly, yeah, clearly, because you have the line of Seth, so, so Seth, and then you have the, the genealogy in chapter five, and the conclusion of the genealogy in chapter five is, is Lamech, and then giving, giving birth to Noah. So absolutely, Noah is in the line of Seth, and there's no uh, indication. Sorry. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, so it really makes sense that Noah found favor, and that's actually it, it fascinates me the word favor there, because yeah. the basis is not the righteousness of Noah, but God's yeah. grace. 
<laughs> yes, and, yes, yeah. yes, excellent. No, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's right. I just want to, you know, make a... No. And, and, and the other thing too, yeah, the preceding context is in chapter five is that they're calling upon the name of the Lord. So, <coughs> so faith is present. Faith is preceding the good, anything good. Noah being righteous and blameless, it's because of his faith. It's because, it's because of, 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 of his trusting and in relationship with, with God, the work of the spirit, the spirit is working in his life. All right. It, 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 we we wouldn't we would we we can't ignore those other things. Number one, number two, uh, in the New Testament, we clearly see we clearly see the revelation of what is the condition of mankind. So we wouldn't say that uh, it would be incorrect to, to disregard all of the biblical theological framework, the the, the explanation of the New Testament. Say, well, no, 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 no. In reality. Uh, Noah was actually he was he was he was perfect. He was good. He 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 did it. He earned his own salvation. You 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 could not say that. It's going against everything. It's mm -hmm. going against the context. It's going against it's mm -hmm. going against the framework and everything. So I I want us to see this because there there are people that will say that they will say that no Noah earned his favor with God and we would want to say absolutely not. There's so much presupposed. There. Yeah. Great. Great. Yeah. So yeah. yeah the, the, is this also, sir? Uh, you could, you could also see in this text uh, that uh, you know the author wants us to see that God really choose God really choose a remnant or you know you know in his divine choice really choose um, certain people <laughs> to be his yeah. own people like that uh, yeah so what we want to say Sonny, yeah, yeah so I, what we can we wanna conclude that way as we read yeah. this especially when so, we look at this as how the yeah well so uh, what i want to say is, yeah so, i'm sorry sonny you're cutting you're cutting out. i'm sorry I'm, I'm interrupting you because you're cutting in and out um that's a great question sonny what i would say is that the text is not super clear that will be revealed later okay what we want to say um, is that at least we have mm -hmm. echoes. We have evidence of, okay, yes, no, Noah, Noah is someone who's calling upon the name of the Lord. Noah is someone who's trusting. Um, Noah is someone who's obedient. And if he's obedient, he must have faith behind the scenes. But the text isn't emphasizing that. It's not clear yet. So that's why, that's why when, let, um, um, Ray, ask your question, and then, I, and then I'm going to go to a conclusion. Uh, Ray, go ahead, ask your question. I think there's an observation. Yeah. So prior to the fall, <clears throat> everything that man knew was good, right? And when yeah. they ate the food, when they ate the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil, then it was not beneficial at all for them because at the end of yeah. the day, they chose evil, right? Yeah. So I would, I would, I would say, I would observe also from the pattern from which uh, the sons of God get married to the daughters of men. It, it somehow relates to that inclination of man to choose what is evil, Palaga, because that's what, he, even though they, if, if, if it's in the line of said, I doubt if there are, there are no beautiful women there. No, that's a good, that's a good point, Ray. That's a, that, that's a really good point. And what we want to say is that man, apart from the working of God, he, it's it's in our nature. We choose the evil. That's that's in our nature. Yeah. So so that's that that's a that's a good observation. And and I think that's what that's the one theological truth that we that is new but is being clearly revealed to us. So let me let me quickly share this conclusion here, and then we can we can have a discussion on this. So let me um, let me go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. I was pondering how did Noah and his family isolate themselves from being corrupted? Are they living separately away from the civilization? No, that's a good question. I mean, it, I don't think that's the case because in, in Peter, Peter calls Noah a preacher of righteousness. I think, I think he was preaching truth and righteousness to the people and they weren't hearing. And, and I think that what the only thing that protected them, the reason why they were faithful, was because of God's supernatural work of the Spirit in their lives. Uh, you know, I, 
we see that later. We see that later that it's it's only because of God's spirit that these men do great things. David is full of the spirit of God, um, uh, uh, especially in the New Testament. So my answer, Henry, is 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 that I I think that for sure he separated in that they weren't taking the the, the children. The, the, they were engaged in 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 the line of set of of Cain, but I don't I don't think in. I think that they were present with the people in some sense because he's preaching righteousness, um, according to First Peter. So there, there has to be some type of close proximity, maybe not. Okay, let let's look. Uh, David, yeah, David, go ahead. I think the question of Henry is the same question we can we can we can ask about Abraham. How was God able to uh, select Abraham from among the? Gentiles at the at that time. How was he able to pick Ad Abraham? And the same, like, was how was he able to pick Noah amidst the corruption, amidst the wickedness all over? But he was able to pick Noah. Same uh, to me. That's the same question and the same uh, uh, qualification or basis. To me, that's the same. To me, that's the same. Despite and in spite of the wickedness around them, still there is one. That will be yeah. singled out by God. That's amazing to me. That's amazing how how he's able to pick one amidst. It's like looking for a gray uh, uh, something like in in the hack in the in the in the big. Uh, it's very difficult. It's very amazing. And and Koyo Boboy, one day, one day, maybe you won't ever. Some people don't accept this. So, but one day, what's even more amazing is that. Is that Noah and Abraham would have been the same, and God actually sent His He chose them not because of their works, but sent His Spirit to bring about. That's even a whole other level. <laughs> that's even a whole other level, right? And so that, just think about that because Paul talks about that. We'll, we'll talk about that later. Paul talks about that that Jacob was chosen before he or Esau had done anything good or evil, but that God's sovereign election might stand. And so it's, it's mind blowing, you know, we're, we're, we're at the, the precipice of understanding the infinite wisdom of God. And you're there, but you're, you're wrestling with it. It, where will we go? You have the words of life, right? We just have to trust. Maybe this is a place where we just have to trust. Um, anyway, for another time, let's think about that. Maybe you'll lose some sleep tonight thinking. I hope you do, because, because I, think this, I think we're getting to a place where, where Paul talks about meditating, uh, not Paul, but um, the psalmist says, um, calls us to be meditating upon the word of God day and night. And so maybe we're getting to that place. Um, these, are, these are great truths to be meditating upon because this really speaks to the to the grace of god if none of us are deserving um uh it really speaks to his long suffering you know think about how we're so quick to write someone off because of bad behavior right if all of us have this bad behavior how much grace of god by by him being long suffering to even deal with to even deal with um us in our own sin so um what I want us to be, I have this quote here. And so I'm, I'm picking up from Genesis chapter five. So if you're looking at Genesis chapter six, verse five, Genesis chapter six, verse five, that's a foundation for this quotation here. And so this quotation is, is biblically accurate. If we accept the truth of Genesis chapter six, verse five, and there's many other passages in scripture that we can go to. But, but I want us to move from the exegetical, biblical, theological to at least at this point, there's one, there's one new revelation that's clear to us that we can, we can take it to the bank. At this point, we can't, we can't develop really theology of, of works and, and faith. There's echoes there. There's, there's, there's clues there. But we, we still have to wait to the New Testament to have that revelation really clear, although it's present. Okay, so it's not not there but it's not it's not in the foreground what is in the foreground is what jesus the observation that jesus made that it's really a negative a negative theological truth and it's the first step towards the gospel <laughs> it's the first step towards the gospel this negative truth is this 
Theologians speak of man being totally depraved. They mean that man's nature is corrupt, perverse, and sinful throughout. The adjective total does not mean that each sinner is as totally and completely corrupt in his actions and, and thoughts as it is possible for him to be. Instead, total is used to indicate that the whole of man's being has been affected by sin. The corruption extends to every part of man, both body and soul, action, thought, desire. As a result of inborn corruption, the natural man is totally unable to do anything spiritually good. Thus, theologians speak of man's total inability. The inability intended by this termino terminology is spiritual inability. Another quotation here. This is actually from one of our books we're studying uh, in the leadership. So this is what is Reformed Theology. So R.C. Sproul says this, the term total depravity as distinguished from utter depravity refers to the effect of sin and corruption on the whole person. To be totally depraved is to suffer from corruption that pervades the whole person. Sin affects every aspect of our being, the body, the soul, the mind, the will, and so forth. The total or whole person is corrupted by sin. No vestigial island of righteousness escapes the influence of the fall. Sin reaches into every aspect of our lives, finding no shelter of isolated virtue. So coming back here, let's, let's go back to what the word of God says. I want you to see this. I want you to be convinced. So it's every aspect of man. The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth, outward, outward. That every intention of the thought of his heart. So desire is included there. Intention is desire. Thought. Heart. Now, the Hebrew, the, the, the thinking faculty was in the heart because that's where the desires are. But if there was a distinction between thought and desire, it's all included here. So every intention, desire, thought of the heart is only evil continually. That is a theological truth to our condition. And that's the theological truth of our condition prior to our salvation. If everyone here is honest tonight, this described you. And in many ways you wonder like, why did I choose? <laughs> why did I choose? You know, even now when you struggle with the flesh, it's only because of the work of the spirit that we're able to do what's good. If we're honest, if we look into our heart, if we look into our heart and our thoughts, this is true. Um, a parallel passage to this that really brings would be Romans 3, 9 to 20, and also Ephesians 2, 1 to 4. So you can look at that at your own time. But this would be why Voss is primarily negative, because this is a massive climax. And then the rest of the chapter is, uh, is sorry, the rest of the chapter is dealing with, uh, chapter seven and eight is dealing with the, the blotting out of man. Uh, uh, man and animals, creeping things, birds, heavens. So, so that's why it's primarily negative because everyone's going to die. Okay. All right. We're, we're yeah, running. In, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. And so, Sin causes our spirit to die. I think uh, this is the reason why Jesus said, unless a man shall be born again, then the spirit will come into us and make us alive. So that from that, the, uh, we are born of the spirit. We can fight, we can counter, we can, uh, we can defend or fight back the sins which are in yeah. us because of the yeah. spirit in us. Yeah. So there's two components there, just to be clear, just to be clear for everyone. There's the, the new birth. We're given spiritual life to see with spiritual eyes, to, 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 to see spiritual things, to do spiritual things. One. Number two, the spirit actually indwells us to further enable us. So there's two, there's two things there that the spirit do. It gives us new life so that we can see spiritual things. We can cling in faith. We can have good and pure thoughts. And then number two, as Henry said, the spirit dwells us to further strengthen us. It's, it's crazy. It wars against the flesh. It's crazy. Uh, yeah, excellent, excellent uh, point, Henry, and, and bringing this together. 
That, that's why we need the new birth. That's why people cannot do it on their own. And so in your evangelism, brothers and sisters, this could be a passage of scripture. And ask them, do you accept that this is the case? And when they say no, you can say, well, I can't correct you, but look in your own heart and you tell me. Because, because our heart is, our, is so wicked. Our heart, if, you know, no one would want our thoughts from, to, from today to be on the screen. No one would want them to be broadcast. No one would want that. Of, of, of maybe anger, of, of lust, of envy, of these things. And we have to put them to death. We have to put them to death by the power of the Holy Spirit. Anyone else want to add? Anyone else want to add? This is Dean, just a question. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, is the newborn baby is also affected by the sin? Is that right? Yeah, so, so uh, in chapter 9, it's from their youth. Looking, although newborn babies are not explicitly mentioned, uh, we could go elsewhere in scripture. I, I would say what's implied is that this begins at birth. This, if, you're, if you're born in Adam, this, this describes you. You would have to go, um, you'd have to go to other passages of scripture to really further strengthen that. But I would say that's an appropriate conclusion from, from this passage. Anyone that's born in Adam, um, this, is, this is the case. Uh, and just to be really clear, thank you. Thank you. You're, you're, you're welcome. Just to be clear, uh, uh, Pastor Cloyd, this connected with Genesis 8.21. So Genesis 8.21 really says it's beyond just this era. This is, God says, this is, how, this is who man is. This is who man is. Good. Excellent question. Anyone else want to add? Anyone else want to make a comment? Time is fleeting from us. Okay. What I'm going to do is I'm going to move through the rest of the PowerPoint um, ah, we'll go, we'll, we'll talk through the PowerPoint. If you have, uh, questions, we can't really go to the text. Uh, we could always do a little bit of discussion next week. Let, let's finish this PowerPoint here to see the Noahic in Revelation. So I'm just going to highlight what Voss says about the big, the big points that are being taught that the Noahic in Revelation, uh, Revelation is dealing specifically with the covenant and the, the, the common grace given after the, the, the flood. Um, and so there's really, there's really three major things. There's three major things, uh, three major stages, movements to this revelation. The first is the purpose of God to institute a new order of affairs. So this is why many times we just don't know what's happening in Genesis 1 to 9, because God reorders, he restructures the world after the flood. And so many people are talking, you know, they have questions. We just, there's, it's, it's a different structuring. So even looking at how the world functions today, we can't use that as a, an analogy, as, an, as a, a, a test case, or as a, I shouldn't say test case, but as a, um, as a pattern to look back into the Gen Genesis 1 to 9, because the word of God says that um, in, in Genesis 8 and 9, that God restructures. He, he makes some changes, and we see that. So uh, in some ways, we're limited to what God has revealed to us, and, and that's, that's by design. We have, to, we have to trust in that. And so this is focusing upon Genesis 8, 20 to 22. And so God, God recognizes in Genesis chapter 8, verses 20 and 22, 20 to 22, he says that uh, never again will I curse the ground because of man, for the, for the intention of man's heart is evil from his youth. And so what God does is God, in spite of man's sin, God graciously says that he's going to let man live. But the reality is, is that no judgment and no law can cure the heart of man. Does everyone see that there? Judgment and law can only expose the sin and punish the sin, but it can't change the heart. <laughs> That's profound. When, we when the judge executes judgment, when the law exposes the violation, 
it doesn't change. The one who speeds, he gets the ticket. He's still gonna speed. <laughs> cannot change, cannot change the heart. Um, perhaps it can deter, but it cannot change what's in the heart. Um, next, uh, number two, there are measures taken to give content and security to the order. So God sets up this new order and he also sets, sets protective boundaries. So we see this, um, Genesis 9, 1 to 7. So specifically, man is allowed to eat animals, and animals are will be punished if they eat man, okay? Um, uh, man, uh, the, the capital punishment is instituted to protect the sanctity of life. Um, and so here we have... Uh, God is gracious to bring about his greater plan because no judgment, okay, we, we have that already. No judgment at all can, can cure man. Um, uh, Voss says ordinances are instituted in order to make possible and safeguard this program of forbearance. These ordinances refer to the propagation of life, the protection of life from animals and men both, and the, sus, the sustenance of life, okay? So, so God is setting up a new system and he's putting in protective boundaries. And when those protective boundaries are not used or not are not heated, um, there's greater suffering in the world. And so the, 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 the capital punishment is one of them for murder. So we, we can talk about the reasons for that, but at the end of the day, at the end of the day, capital punishment is clearly clearly taught here. You can't really get around it. Um, it's, it's present there and we're commanded, the, the government is commanded to, to exercise it and to exercise it. Um, um, it's not always exercised lawfully or it, with true justice in mind, but it, it ought to be the case. Animals are not to devour man after a carnivorous fashion. And so man is also not to eat animals as wild beasts devour their, devour their prey. He must show proper reverence for life as a sacred thing of which God alone has the disposal. So this really gets at the not eating blood in, in um, at least at this point, not eating blood in with the animal because, because blood has the life and, and, and eating, killing and eating an animal is to be a sacred thing. It's a responsible, it's, 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 it's to be responsible. So, um, I'll, I'll be, I'll be honest and transparent and, and I hope I don't step on anyone's toes. That's why, for example, like cockfighting is really against this. Th that is an abuse of, of God's creation. In the U S we have dog fighting. Okay. So here in the Philippines, you have, you have cockfighting. Um, but that would be violating this, that you're no longer respecting and reverencing the sanctity of life. You're 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 watching life die for sport, and that's we really. Have horse fighting. Oh my goodness! Okay, there you go. Horse fighting too. Yeah, that type of violence exemplifies the pre-flood uh, sin and and corruption of mankind, and is against what we're called to do. So any form of promotion of fighting that leads to death, especially so. We and, and it's each culture has an issue with this. So I say this not as an American looking down on Filipinos. We have hor we have dog fighting in the U.S. and and I love dogs more than roosters, and so it's it's even more troubling. Lastly, there is the protection of human life from the assault of man, and and there it lays down the divine law for punishment for murder. And and Paul re reaffirms this in in, in Romans thirteen that the government is designed to bear the sword, and so. Not a lot of people recognize this, but this is this is as long. So this is the thing. People will say, oh, it's so early in the word of God. As long as there's a rainbow, this should be instituted. As long as God has promised that he will not judge, we should be following this. Okay. So is the rainbow still in the cloud? Yes. So we should be following, we should be following this. Um, yeah. I, I would say this that. Voss talks about it, not necessarily, you know, the, the, the meat eating, the, 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 the blood being eaten. And my perspective, 
that's for another time. I'll just share my perspective. I think it's really this culture of either eating, eating, uh, eating flesh like a wild animal or, or, or just like, and maybe this is a little bit stepping on some toes, but where you're eating blood as a, as its own dish. So th th that's my understanding. I, I don't think if you were to have rare steak that's cooked, but maybe there's a, there's like, um, like like the a little bit of uh, of I don't think that's what it's referring to because you're cooking it. It's I think it's in the context of just eating like pure blood or eating it ravenously without properly killing and and and, and cooking. I think that's I think that's the context. That's my interpretation. It's not black. It's not it's not gospel. But that that's my understanding. Um, so um, um, each of you, eat, I would I, say each of go ahead. Yeah. I think Tim. Eating blood is okay if you combine it with puto. Ginaguan. <laughs> Ginaguan. <laughs> anyway, that'll be for you to study. I'll say that'll be for you. I'm just sharing my interpretation, but that'll be for you to study and it'll be for you. Anyway, when you get to heaven yeah. and you're before the judgment, go ahead, go ahead, uh, boy, boy. Yeah, just to make, just, uh, just uh, to make sure I got you. When you said that, uh, Tim, are you saying that uh, for as long as the blood is cooked, it does not violate this one? Is that what you're saying? It's the eating of the blood that is not cooked that is really repugnant to God's uh, understanding of this command. Yeah, so th and that's where it's like, yeah, I, I yeah, that's, that's a whole, that's another, I wasn't even actually thinking about the cooked versus uncooked. What I, what I was saying, what, what I was more thinking along the lines of just eating blood purely of its own, because that's more in reference to um, eating blood on its own or just ravenously eating meat without pre preparing it. So like something like Danuguan, that, that's maybe a gray area you know, um, that you would have to study on your own. You'd have to come to a convinced position and you would just be, it would be for you and God, um, you know, um, so. Yeah, it, so usually it, it, we eat dinoguan, there's always rice and puto with it, so it's okay. What's for you? I'm not gonna say it's okay. I'm not, I'm not going to appease your conscience. I'm gonna say you need to study it. You need to study it from the biblical theological framework. <laughs> Oh my goodness. You know, like not, oh my goodness. I don't want to. I, I cannot eat it. I cannot eat it. So, but that's for you. So what I want to say is I don't want to let you off the hook, but maybe it's okay. It, it really, you need to be, you need to study it on your own. It's for what you. about, uh, last, last part, last part. What about the internal organs? Is there a specific prohibition about eating internal organs other than blood? I don't think so. I, I have not. I have not seen, and, and I. I can stand corrected. I. Did, I don't recall there any being, there, there being in the Mosaic Law, and of course we're not under the Mosaic Law. Although, there's an interpretation there that we just don't have time to. But I, I don't think there's. I don't think there's reference to that. So, um, that would be more. That would be again a a a personal conviction. You know, that would be a personal conviction. Um, and that would yeah. be on the no, kuya Buboy, on your uh, doctor's internist law. You not eat that; it's not healthy. Yeah, since this is a part part of the what the, what the Old Testament law, the ceremonial law, so uh, we are not under that kind of well, law. It's anymore, a it's so. a dietary 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 law. Uh, it's not a civil or a moral law either. So we can eat. <laughs> and it, well. <laughs> Well, I, yeah, what I want to say is, and that could be, what I want to say is you need to study. You need to, you, I would recommend, yeah. I would recommend each one of you. Don't say, oh, T Pastor Tim, Pastor Sonny, Pastor Henry said it was okay. Or Pastor Tim said it wasn't okay, so I'm not going to do it. You should study it on your own. And, and, and you should be convinced because at the end of the day, we will all give an account for what's in our, what, what we do in our body before, before God. And so you, you, you will give an account. So I don't want to give you an assurance I don't want to give you the assurance. Okay, it's it's for you. So let's, I think let's leave it. It, 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 wait, my understanding is when that that law was introduced even among Christians, it was just not to offend their Jewish Christians at the time. Because at the end of the day, 
anything you eat, it's not a matter. I mean, righteousness is not a matter about eating or drinking, right? Yeah. But but so but so but so that and that would be fine for the perhaps for the Mosaic law. But my question would be: Is that is should we still be practicing capital punishment? Yeah. According to for, this passage, for, yes. According to Boss, there's a reason for that. I just forget the right yeah. Yeah, context. Yeah. So, still okay so, to do that so because it's not going yeah. to be you're not murdering another person it's just part of god's plan that you are not really to yeah. to kill anyone so as part of punishment it requires that you have to be paid you have to undergo similar yeah, uh, yeah. punishment so so, so ray the, so, so, hold on hold on, hold on. okay so, so so ray the rub the rub is that in, in genesis 9 capital punishment is in effect and so it, it continues as long as the rainbow is there okay it's part of the it's part of the promise and so here as well there's the command not to eat the blood so even putting aside the mosaic law you have this command so if if you if you answer in the affirmative that capital punishment is still in effect we should be practicing it you still have the the blood because it's there in verse number it's there in verse number four so that's that's also something else to consider. So, That's a good thing. Don't eat blood anymore. <laughs> I don't. And I. I think, yeah. Uh, I think Tim, in our animals' blood is yeah. not compatible to human blood. Yeah. Similarly, we cannot receive, we cannot be transfused with human blood of not the same type with us. Yeah. Otherwise, we will yeah. die. No, I agree with that as well. That's also true. Yeah. So these are all things we need to consider. So what I, what I, what I want you to do is I want you to, to every one of us need, needs to have our own uh, interpretation and conviction. You know, I don't want to make it to say it's purely gray and there is no answer. There is an answer. Um, um, but there is also some of the gray areas. So for example, cook versus uncooked. You know how much? So, so there is there is um, there is a there is a clear and then a not so clear. So what I'm saying is, every one of us should be should study. You should study. Say, take some time, study, look at all the passages, and work through it. And um, yeah, I don't want to give anyone a false assurance, but I don't want to condemn anyone. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so I, uh, this is something where you need to study. Okay. So this is something where you have a family. You have mm. God has given you a mind, and so I, I want I want us all to consider. And um, maybe you come to a different conclusion than let's say Kuya Bolboy or Kuya Henry. That, that that's fine. At the end of the day, you are responsible for yourself. So let's leave it there. Great discussion. So I think this really causes us to think. I'm really excited about this. This is good. Um, uh, you know. Um, so anyway, let's let's move on here because we're running out of time. Uh, the time is going. Um, uh, and, and, and the last reason for this is that, especially for the capital punishment, is this, is that, is that we are created in the image of God. And so what Sonny said earlier was a beautiful statement, was that when we, when we kill another human being, we, it, it is an assault on the image of God, when we murder another human being. And so the reason for, at the end of the day, why we need to, we have a sanctity of life is because we are all, even if we are deformed by the curse, we are still image bearers of God. And so that means something. That means something profound. And, and we, can, we can see God through um, life, through, through, through humanity. And so God does not take that lightly, and neither should we. Um, so we should support, we should support capital punishment in the civil level. We should also support for, for true justice because sometimes it is abused. So that doesn't mean that we should not support true justice. And we should also support reform. So where there is corruption, we should support reform. So, so my answer is to all the above, yes. Um, uh, moving on here. Uh, the last thing that we see here, number three, is uh, um, God gives his promise so the new order is confirmed in the form of a bereth or in the form of a covenant. Okay, so we see that God's, God's promise is always connected with his covenant now. Okay, so going back to Genesis, Adamic covenant, the, 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 the covenant of grace in the Proto-Evangelium, 
God confirms it with a covenant. Later, we'll see that the, the covenant of grace be, become more accented in the future. But for now, we see it clearly in, in, in Noah's time. Um, God gives a promise. Um, he gives the promise not to judge. Um, and then he adds the solemn sign, which is the rainbow. And so we have the rainbow, we have circumcision, um, and then later in the New Testament, we'll have baptism, okay? And so when we look at the rainbow, when we see the clouds, we should be contemplating, these are symbols, we should be contemplating the, the common grace that God has given to us. I do have a quotation for common grace. I'm, I mentioned common grace several times. Let me finish the PowerPoint, and then I'll, and then I'll quote common grace, and, and we'll be done here. This part is not in Voss. But I wanted to make connections with truths that Voss has already pointed out. So this is this is making application from from Voss's uh, from Voss's uh, um, principles that he gave us in the first redemption. So uh, this is like a, an application of Voss. Uh, number number one: Life is promised to Noah and God's creation, but it is conditioned upon obedience. So you have life and prohibition. You have the principle of life and prohibition in the life of Noah. Does everyone see that there? It's clear. Noah is called to build an ark. He's called to gather the animals. And if he obeys during that prohibition, he will be saved. And this is literally, this is literal salvation. This is, this is not concerning eternal salvation. This is concerning a literal salvation. So if it's a literal physical salvation, we can also see that perhaps he is going to form a type, a pattern for eternal salvation that is to come. And actually, this is the case that we brought up in the past that we see in, in, in 1 Peter, where, where Peter makes a connection of, of, Noah's, of Noah's ark as being a type for baptism for us. Okay, and, but, but the big point I want to bring out here is that life is promised to Noah. Literal life is promised to Noah if he obeys. And of course, we see that he does. Um, this relationship is offered in the form of covenant. So we talked about how covenant is fundamental. Covenant is fundamental for, um, uh, uh, for a framework, a biblical theological framework. And we see that being exercised in Noah's life. Number three, God judges mankind and brings death upon them because of their failure to obey him because of their evil wickedness. So we see this death. Death is both symb uh, a, sim a symbolic for something greater, eschatological death, but it again, it appears in physical form. God judges and, and people die, okay? Uh, number four, in judgment though, we see that God is grace, uh, uh, gracious and faithful to his promise to Adam and Eve. So God has not forgotten his promise to Adam and Eve, even though mankind for the most part has been unfaithful. Let God be true and everyone else a liar. He remains faithful, even though mankind as a body, as a race was unfaithful and wicked. We see judgment mingled with grace. And so going back to the, those who made the observation um, about the, the end being grace of the story of Genesis 4 to 9, we, uh, we see that here. Um, Next, we see the promised seed, the proto-evangelium, being fulfilled in Noah. Life is preserved. God's promise, although it's not fulfilled fully, there is a partial fulfillment. He does save the human race through Noah. Um, ah, I, okay, I, I added this here. Uh, I meant to have this pop, pop through. But we didn't really talk about this. Later, we'll, we'll, we'll go into detail when we go into the New Testament. But what we do see in, in Genesis, Voss doesn't really highlight this, but it's present there. And um, um, if we had more time, I would have unpacked this. Uh, we'll unpack it later in the semester, uh, perhaps. But in Genesis, Adam is the prototype of prophet, priest, and king. Okay? You can study this on your own time. He has the kingly function. In Genesis 1, 26 to 28, and also 2, 15, in that, he is, um, in that he is given dominion over the earth. Dominion literally is kingdom. He is given the, 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 the earth as his kingdom. And so by implication, if, he, if he's given dominion, if he's given ruler, 
rulership over the earth, then then he's given this kingly function. It's in a it's in it's in a fundamental form. Um, number two, he is a prophet. A prophet fundamentally, it's not someone who tells the future, although that can be. A prophet is is fundamentally. You might want to write this down. You should always understand and recall this. A prophet is is someone who speaks the word of God to the people. So he he functions as a mediator from God to the people. He gives the people his the word of God, okay? A priest works the opposite way. A priest gives the people uh, speaks the will of the people to God. Okay? And so what in, in the New Testament we actually see that we are all priests. We all communicate directly with God, okay? But but here Adam in some form is a priest. That is that he that he is to speak um, on behalf of, of, of creation and, and most importantly, Eve. Now he never exercises this because he just falls into sin. He never even gets to this place. But but there is echoes of this um, in the garden, and most especially in this God is the king of the universe. The earth is a kingdom given to man. And so man is this mediator between God and the creation. Does everyone see that? So, so in, in Genesis 1, 26 to 28, there's also this idea of mediation. And so mediation includes both being a prophet and being a priest from, from, from the creation to God. Now, he ne- never actually fulfills this because he, he falls almost immediately. Now, why do I say this? Why do I say this? Because Noah, Noah is seen as a prophet, priest, and king. Noah, Noah has these three positions with more clarity. Noah is given the responsibility over the animals both before the flood and after the flood. This is a kingly responsibility. Um, Noah is given the command of God. He's to proclaim it to, to his family, to the family that's with him. So he is a prophet. Uh, he communicates God's will to his to his family, and actually, he said later, according to First Peter, that he is a, or maybe I'm maybe it's Second Peter. I, I apologize. It's one of the Peters, one of the epistles. But he's he's a preacher of righteousness, and so he's actually also preaching the gospel to to the fallen race around him. So clearly, Noah, maybe not accented, but is present nonetheless. He is a prophet. And then lastly, what's being accented is Noah is actually, he, he intercedes for both his family, the human race, and the animals. In Genesis 8, 20 to 22, he sacrifices, and his sacrifice is seen as being accepted by God. And so he is fulfilling, he is, he is pro, um, propitiating and also um, expiating uh, um, this, uh sin and 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 it's very clear that god accepts the sacrifice he accepts the sacrifice so so noah is interceding for humanity and the natural world um so he is fulfilling this media this mediator type position and so what we can say going a little bit deeper in addition to everything else is that noah is a type of christ who is to come Noah is a type of Christ who is to come. Okay. Notice now, these are all, this is all physical. And so we would not say that Noah saves himself eschatologically. There's two differences. Is everyone tracking here? Noah's salvation that he earns is physical salvation, not eschatological. So it's wrong to even mention that Noah is saving himself in a salvific sense. Is everyone tracking there with me with what I'm saying? Any questions on that? So, so Noah's salvation that he secures is a physical one, not the eschatological eternal one, okay? And that's why Hebrews 11 says he too is by faith being saved and a part of, of the sacrifice of Christ's eternal blood. Any questions or comments? I hope that this is making sense. This is going a little bit beyond Voss. This is making a little more connections. So the last thing I hope that we can see here is that Voss is giving us the most fundamental truths, but not the comprehensive. There's a lot more that we could add. 
there's a lot more that we could add. And even here, I've just showed you some more additional things. There are additional books that are written beyond Voss's work. And so um, in all our courses at EVST, we are looking at when we have a, when we have, we're teaching any concept, every truth, we should always begin from a biblical theological framework. And pretty much almost everything begins in the garden in, in some form, in some principial form. Okay, whether it's the nature of man, whether it's the requirement of man, whether it's whatever it is, uh, the character of God, the person of God, sin, temptation, it, it all begins there. And so Genesis 1, Genesis 1 to 11 is fundamental for the rest of scripture. I hope everyone can see that. And so the, histor the historicity of Genesis is absolutely fundamental. And um, yeah, I, I hope that we see this. Anyone else want to add? We're, we're late. I, I shouldn't say we're late. We're on time because we started late. But anyone wants to add? Uh, what fascinates me, Sir Tim, in this account of Noah and probably the rest is that um, their passivity and receptive of God's command. They do not even they do not even go, uh, you know, or advance God's God's plan like like that. So. We, we, for example, when when the flood, uh, when there, there's already the drag ground, um, uh, Noah really uh, wait for God to for God to, to say go out and <laughs> something like that, and then he follows uh, so much so, and, and Abraham probably never. So there is a receptive and um, um, passivity rather than active and you know yeah. active in France. and um, it really reminds me when I read this account from. Chapter one and chapter it's really it's really true that uh, you know Genesis one and uh, the, the Garden of Eden is the foundation of biblical theology, because you could see there that that the, those who are really doing the you know who are arrogantly active, yeah. it seems like uh, the the go or, or advance God's God's you know command. What what the failure there, as I see it, the failure is that they would become racist and full to sin. Yeah. Unlike unlike Noah or you know this uh, um, those who are calling starting to call God uh, and and Shemites and also the you know <laughs> the terms there uh, the the one who has it connected to God or the sons yeah. of God really yeah. wait for God to say something and then they follow. So yeah. uh, it seems to me that the relevance of that for me uh, it, as I reflect that well you know we have this is the a you know a theological aspect of it that. Me as a part of the kingdom of God, or, or which Christ makes my king, is to really wait for God's sovereign, to be mindful of God's sovereignty, and to yeah. wait in His command. You know, yeah, no, yeah. His no, will be done. Yeah, no, that's really good, Sonny, and that's actually something we could add. That Voss highlights, and maybe that's what you're highlighting there, and 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 that's a profound statement that that God must act. Even in the saving of Adam, he acts first. And so I think what you're saying is absolutely, it's a great observation, Sonny. Excellent observation that, that we have to wait for God to act. And so sometimes we're so quick to try to do things, but at the end of the day, we have to wait on him, follow his lead. <laughs> Excellent. Excellent. Anyone else want to add? Tim, Tim, just, yeah. just one point before we finally go. Uh, it's very interesting to know God made a promise, never again he will uh, punish men as mankind, uh, etc., etc. But uh, if we see the life of Noah after the flood, it seems he allowed again sin to creep into <laughs> Noah himself. So yes. oh that's my goodness. very amazing. But why did he allow that to happen to Noah? The, uh, the heart, but the heart of man. That's why we cannot say that even Noah is... Oh my goodness. I, let's wait till next week. It's so good. I'm going to wait till next week. That is a, a profound, oh my goodness, Koya Boboy. Compare the sin of Noah with even the garden. It's almost the same. I'm, that's going to be an assignment for next week. Look at the comparisons. I won't say anything else. Look at the comparisons. Oh my goodness. Excellent yeah, observation. You guys are thinking, I am so happy. I just, my heart is full right now. Excellent observation. We're making the connections. Praise God. Anyone else want to add? This is excellent. She asked, she asked that question, uh, when I read Voss, I always look 
look at chapter 4 where verse 6 this said that you know man sided with <laughs> satan and so you know you know although god you know uh, choose noah and abraham they still fall into sin why because you know they're just human being and then we have the description in chapter 6 it, that's really fascinating and amazing uh, yeah. description <laughs> Okay, um, anyone else want to add? It's late. I'm sure everyone wants to go to bed. Anyone else want to add? Anyone else want to make a comment? Speak now or forever hold your peace. You can add if you want. In other words, uh, you know, God cannot, you know, cannot trust human being. No. <laughs> he cannot trust human being. No, don't trust human beings too. <laughs> <laughs> And um, we won't have the breakout session. I'll just, I'll close this in prayer and I'll have a short blessing for all of us. And thank you for your time. We, we went a little bit over. I hope that this was enlightening for you. I want to be so honest with you that that Voss is hard to read. And, and I just ask that you stick with it. And if we work together as a team, it's hard, but, but I hope that we learn. And it's, I just... You know, I believe with all my heart that this is this needs to be fundamental for EVST. Um, I think that um, yeah, one day maybe we can we can have a paraphrase that makes it easier and like a, like an expansion of Voss's teaching. Um, but yeah. let's let's stick with it because we're I am learning so much. I want to tell you that I am bl being blessed so much. I changed the position even this weekend, and so we need to have humble hearts and. There are things we're going to disagree. I disagree with we've also on other things. And so we need to have humble hearts and just ask the spirit to lead us. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you so much for tonight. And I just, you know, I know your spirit was with us, was present here, Father. Father, I pray that you would bind the, the hand of Satan, that, that his hand would not prosper against EVST, against CGST, Father. May, may BTC, CGST, and EVST grow and, and be a, a, a beacon of light in Asia, in the Philippines, in Visayas for, for your kingdom, Father God. Uh, may no hand uh, against us prosper, Father, no, no tool or weapon. And, and I pray that these truths would not just be this, an act of intellectual uh, advancement, but, we, but these truths would transform our hearts, Father God, that we would be uh, more humble leaders. We would, we would be more wise le leaders, Father, that we would be more practical leaders, and, and we would recognize that no one is above uh, above sin. No one is above is above the the ability of falling into sin. Father, may we trust in you for 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 everything in life. And so, Father, I just ask a blessing upon about upon the students tonight. Um, may, may God uh, bless them. May you bless them. May you keep them. May uh, your face shine upon them, and may you be gracious to them. And may your countenance be lifted up upon them and may you give them peace. And we pray this only in the blood, through the blood, by the blood of Jesus Christ, the one who stands before us in heaven at your right hand interceding for us. We pray it in his name, our Lord and Savior, the one we love. Amen.